Glad to be back with you. Saw some of you all last night as we were looking at this series on the Holy Spirit. And to catch everybody up to speed to where we are, we looked last night at the fact that the Holy Spirit is not a power or a force, but it's a person. He's a he. He's a third part of the Trinity, and he's just as much God as the Father and the Son. But we also looked at the fact that don't try to divide the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because even though they have distinct roles, they're always working together in those roles. We looked at the fact that when, if you were asked somebody who, who created the world, the Bible says that God the Father in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But then the next verse says the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Yet John 1 and Colossians 1 tell us that nothing was made that wasn't made by Jesus. When we try to wrestle with who sends us out to preach, well, the Bible says that the Father sends us out to preach. Because the blessed are those who, uh, the feet of those who preach the good news, the Father said. But on top of that, Jesus in John 20, 21 said, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. We saw in Acts chapter 13 that the Holy Spirit sent them out to preach. So again, you're going to get yourself messed up trying to divide the Trinity. They're all God. There's one God, but he's manifested himself in three persons. And the Bible even tells us that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 and 20 through 24. Yet also, Jesus himself, in John chapter 10 verses 17 and 18 said I lay my life down I raise it up again on top of that the Bible says in first Peter that Jesus was put to death in the flesh but raised by the spirit so we looked at the fact that God Holy Spirit is God himself it's a he he's a person he's not a power or force it's someone you can relate to just like you can pray to Jesus you can pray to the Holy Spirit just like you pray to the Father you can pray to the Holy Spirit and we looked at that aspect of who he was but we then dealt with what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit and there's been a lot of confusion and we looked and saw that scripturally there is only one baptism of the Holy Spirit Ephesians chapter 4, Paul even says that. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. The thing is, is that the Bible's word baptism is very clear. It's when we're put into Christ and he's put into us. When you all get baptized, and I've seen some baptism services here, the people go into the water and they come back out and the word baptized is to put into and that's what happens when we trust Christ as our Savior. Jesus had promised that the Holy Spirit was going to come and be in us. Oh, but not only that, Jesus said in that day that you realize that I'm in you and you're in me and I'm in the Father. You want to talk about swimming in God. He, he's in us and we're in him and he's in the Father. When you get saved, you are baptized, put into God, put into Jesus. He's put into you. You are swimming in God. And I jokingly told everybody last night that if you want your water baptism to be a real picture of your salvation, don't plug your nose and, open, and don't close your mouth. I mean, because <laughs> he's in you, you're in him. I'm not recommending that because some of you might not survive it. But here's the deal. You, when you got saved, you got all of God you're ever going to get. You don't need another baptism. You don't need another experience where God comes upon you. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 says that we, in Christ, the deity lives in bodily form and you have been filled in him. Second Peter chapter 1 verses 3 and following says his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. Now we have to learn how to partake of the divine promises. So if you're born again and you've been saved by faith in Jesus Christ, you've got all of God inside of you. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit all live within you right now. Now we then dealt with lastly last night at the fact that what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? And that means that the Bible actually is talking about that's different from your baptism. Your baptism is when you get saved and he puts in himself into you and you into him. But the filling is a daily continual process of learning to let the God who lives within us have control. That's why the Bible says be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit of God who's within you have control. And that's a process that we're going to learn over the years as we learn to grow in our knowledge of him. Believe his word. As we were singing this morning, praise team, thank you for leading us in a tremendous time of worship and as we were singing the words i exalt thee god began to speak to my heart and he said tell them this if they want to exalt me tell them to believe me that's and i'm preaching to myself too folks we can easily say oh god you're awesome oh god you're wonderful god you're great and he says then do what i say take me at my word Jesus himself said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? And so I want to challenge you, and I'm challenging myself as well. We have God within us. We have so much available to us, promises in his word, 
And he says, believe me, do what I say, and you'll be blessed. What we're going to deal with this morning, though, is we're going to deal with the fact that the Holy Spirit not only lives within us, he not only has baptized us, the Holy Spirit has not only wanting to fill us and control us on a daily basis, he has also chosen what our role will be in the church and how he wants to use us in this world. And he's predetermined what our gifts are going to be. And I'm going to show you through scripture tonight. He's not only predetermined what your gifts are going to be. He's also predetermined where and when and how he wants you to use them. And he's also the one that's going to be empowering you to do the things that he has in mind. And so we're going to a lot to cover. So grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to look at verses 1 through 11 this morning. I'm going to read this passage and we'll pray and we're going to jump into it. You say, we hadn't jumped into it yet? Not even close. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. Now, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, for one To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills let's pray together father as we begin to break this passage down and to use the whole of your word to understand and get the correct understanding and interpretation we also know that it's only through your holy spirit that we're able to understand and get the correct interpretation and so father i pray a couple of prayers right now i pray right now that if there be anyone listening online or if there's be anybody here this morning that has not yet come to that point of surrender of their life and their sin to Jesus and his payment for their sin. Father, I pray that today as we talk to believers about the Holy Spirit and his work in our lives after salvation, that if there's anyone here that has not been born again, that your spirit would be speaking clearly to their heart of their need of salvation first and foremost. Father, may they not jump into second and third and fourth grade things today. May they go to the beginning of what they need to how to be born again and we thank you that that's been already proclaimed as jeff has said today in his prayer and as pastor davis said and as we've worshiped you in the song time we know and it's been proclaimed in this place that there is salvation in no one else except through jesus christ and the fact that he lived the sinless life he died in our place he rose from the dead and gives eternal life to all who believe in him Father, if there's anyone here that has not been born again, may you show that to them so clearly that they have no choice but to respond in faith. But Lord, I pray a second prayer. I pray for all of us who have been born again, who have been given of your spirit. We have been baptized. We have this filling available to us, but we've never really fully understood what it meant to be led of the spirit, to be empowered by the spirit, to work in the gifts and the calling you have for each of us. Father, I pray that what you have in mind for each of us would become clear, not only a little bit more this morning, but also in time as we continue to get more involved in each other's lives, as we actually don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but actually do it all the more as we see the day approaching, that you would use your purposes to accomplish good in each one's lives and for the kingdom of God. And so, Lord, I know that what we're covering today is big and important and more than i'm able to communicate to everyone in this room and those who are listening online but i thank you that all you ask of me is to be empowered and yielded to your spirit empowered by your spirit and yielded to your spirit and i thank you for the fact that you are going to do through me the things you've called me to do and gifted me to do and i thank you that i get to live out what i'm going to preach today and you get the glory we pray this in jesus name amen 
Now, before we dive into spiritual gifts, we have to deal with the beginning of this chapter. Look closely at what Paul says. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts. If you know anything about the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll know that Paul has been dealing with some issues in the church in Corinth. He actually has had to begin in chapter 1 with the fact that they were all fighting over who they thought was the best pastor or preacher or teacher of the Word of God. I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, which is Peter, and I follow Christ. And he's had to deal with the fact that there are divisions in the church. In chapter 7, he's actually answering questions that had to do with sexual purity and whether you should be married or single and all those things. And he actually writes a very similar introduction in chapter 7. He says, now concerning the matters you wrote to me about, And if you look closely, you'll see that he's most likely dealing with a problem that has arisen in the church in Corinth. And he says, now concerning spiritual gifts. Actually, if you have a study Bible, you might have a little note next to that word, spiritual gifts. And your study Bible might point out that it also could be translated spiritual persons. You see, what Paul was dealing with in the church in Corinth was that there were individuals in the church who actually were claiming to be spiritual and they were causing problems in the church. Oh, they were saying they were exercising their spiritual gift, but it was doing more damage and causing chaos in the church. And that's why if you were to dive into chapters 12, 13, 14, 15, and so on, you'll know that Paul has to deal with spiritual gifts and how to know whether or not their people are being led of the Spirit in their spiritual gifts or whether or not they're doing it for their own glory. And that's why in chapter 13 he talks about how it doesn't matter if you can speak in the tongues of men and angels. If you don't have love, what it's useless. He's dealing with the chaos that's being created by it. Then he deals in chapter 14 and so on, dealing with how the order and worship and all that. And folks, let me just say this to you. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've run across many people who all of a sudden started to get into things of the Spirit, and all of a sudden they were better than you, and they started teaching things that weren't biblical, and they said it was just the Spirit. Well, don't miss what Paul said here. He says a couple of things. He said, first, now concerning spiritual people and spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be uninformed You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. In other words, what he says to him was, before you got saved, you Corinthians got to remember, you used to do some wacky stuff. You used to worship gods that aren't even gods. So before I go into this, humble yourself and acknowledge you are susceptible to wrong teaching. All right? And then he says... And no one speaking by the Spirit of God can say Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the, by the Holy Spirit. In other words, you're going to have evidence as to whether or not this person really is spiritual. And whether or not the Spirit of God's really working through them. With whether or not what they do and what they say lines up with the truth. Or whether or not it doesn't. If it doesn't line up with the truth... I don't care how spiritual they say they are. I don't care how much they say they're from God. It doesn't. It's not from God. And if it is from God, it'll line up with his truth. And then he said this. God has given the spiritual gifts for what? Let's take a look at it. He says there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Varieties of service, but the same Lord. Varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all and everyone. And to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what? For the common good. Listen closely before we start diving into this. If you say what you're doing is a spiritual gift, but you say it's a private thing between you and God, it's not a spiritual gift. Did you hear that? The spiritual gifts have been given for the common good. There's lots of people that have taken the misunderstanding of what tongues actually is in the Bible, and I don't have time today to dive into that topic, and I'm sorry if you're going to be a little disappointed, but I'm not going to even break down all the gifts that he lists here. We're going to go into a different direction. But let me just say this to you. If they say, well, this is from God, and it's between me and God, all well and good, it's not a spiritual gift. Because spiritual gifts are for the common good. 
Oh, and by the way, spiritual gifts aren't given to us so that we'll look impressive in front of other people. And a lot of people try to become spiritual because they want people to be impressed with them. No, spiritual gifts are given to us for the building up of the body and to encourage and to build each other up. And it's really more about God getting the glory than us. And so there's all different types of gifts. There's all different types of service. There's all different kinds of activities. And the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus, and the Father are involved in all of that. Now, he then goes into a listing of gifts in the next verses. I'm not going to get into those today because we don't have time to break them all down. This isn't the only list. There's other lists in Romans 12. We're going to look at a couple today. But again, we're not going to break them down. But look at what he says in verse 11. He said, all of these different gifts are empowered by one and the same Spirit, Holy Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as He wills. When you got saved, you not only got the Holy Spirit to come and dwell you, when the Holy Spirit came to indwell you, He also, when He came in, gave you spiritual gifts, gift or gifts, that He wants to use now in and through you. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. You all could probably quote to me verses 8 and 9. But I want you to look closely at verse 10. We're going to look at verses 8 and 9. But I want you to look at verse 10. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not as a result of works. So that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The Bible says that God didn't just save you. He now wants to use you to increase the kingdom. To have other people know about Jesus. Have other people come to salvation. To actually encourage those of us who have been saved. And have, have come into the kingdom. But to help each other grow in our relationship. And he's put us all together with different gifts and different roles. So the first thing I want you to grasp is this. God, when he saved you, not only gave you his Holy Spirit to seal you as a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. He's also given you gift, a gift or gifts that he wants to use for his purposes to build up the body and to help increase the kingdom. Here's the second thing I want you to grasp from what we're looking at today. He not only has chosen what gift you have or gifts you have. He's also predetermined how, when, and where he wants you to use them. You don't get to go and say, well, my gift is this. I'm, I, say, say, I could say my gift is preaching. I want to just go preach wherever. It's not how it works. No, he not only determines what gift you have, he's the one who determines where you get to use it, when you get to use it, and how you get to use it. You know how Paul tried to go into Asia? What did the Spirit say? No. He then tried to go into Mysia. What did the Spirit say? No. And this, he had to learn how to let the Holy Spirit show him where and when he was to use his gifts. So just because you got a gift doesn't mean, well, this is my gift, I'm just going to use it. No, 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 no. You only use it when and where and how God wants you to. Let me show you this from the scriptures. Go to Acts chapter 13. Look at verses 1 through 3. Now they were in the church at Antioch. There were prophets and teachers. Remember, God determined some are prophets, some are teachers, some are evangelists, some are pastors. Barnabas was one of them. Simeon, who was also called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who was a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. So here we have five guys that are listed as elders in the church there in Antioch, and we know a couple of them. Barnabas, he's pretty cool, and Saul, we, he, we know him as Paul. But look at what happens. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said... Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Here there were, in this church in Antioch, a really great group of elders. and Some were pastors, some were teachers, some were prophets. And they were there, and while they were worshiping the Lord, God said, I've got a plan for Barnabas and Saul. I want to send them off. And they began their missionary journeys. I've often jokingly thought that that church there in Antioch probably wasn't too excited to hear about that. I mean, 
God took the best two that we would pick. When we'd think those are the best two. I mean, Barnabas and Paul, I mean, those are the two ones. I can almost see the church members going, take Lucius. Don't take those guys. But you know what? He had already determined that even though they were in this church, he had a specific plan that he had for them, and they sent them off. Go to Acts chapter 9. Look at verses 10 through 15. This is right after Paul meets Jesus. He gets saved on the road to Damascus. And he's been blinded by God. And now there was a disciple at Damascus, Acts 9 verse 10, named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he's praying. And he has, been, he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Do you see that? Paul had just gotten saved. He wasn't even but hours saved. He wasn't even, he's a baby Christian. And God says to Ananias, I've already chosen him to go preach to the Gentiles and their kings and also to the people of Israel. I mean, if you know Paul's life, God had him go preach before Herod and, uh, and, and, and Caesar and all the officials in Rome. But God had already planned for Paul to do that before Paul was even saved. God has a plan for each of your lives. He didn't just save you. He had already predetermined, planned beforehand the works that he wanted you to do. You want to exalt God? Believe his word. You want to say, God, you're awesome. God, I exalt you. God, you're the greatest God. You're my God. He says, don't just call me Lord, Lord. Do what I say. Believe my word. And folks, you've got to wrestle with this this morning. I'm looking at everybody here, not just me, not just the elders who are here. Either you believe the word of God or you don't believe the word of God. Did he save you? Did he give you his spirit? If your answer is yes, That means he's already predetermined how he wants to use you. Oh, by the way, there's more evidence of this. Go to Galatians chapter 2. If you know anything about Paul, Paul really, 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 and I can't say enough really, he's wanted to go and preach to the Jews. He even said in Romans chapter 9 that if he could go to hell and that would cause the nation of Israel to get saved, he'd go to hell. You want to talk about a real desire for your nation to come to faith in Jesus. Paul wanted to preach to the Jews. But God says, no, I've chosen you to go to the Gentiles. Look at chapter 2 of Galatians, verses 7 through 9. On the contrary, Paul says, when they, as the leaders in the church in Jerusalem, saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, that's the Gentiles, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars or leaders in the church, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and that they to the circumcised. So here, Paul said, look, it became evident that the Spirit was planning, even though I wanted to preach to the Jews, God had chosen Peter to go preach to the Jews, and he'd chosen me to go preach to the Gentiles. Go to Romans chapter 12. God not only has determined what gift you have and where he wants you to use it, he's also predetermined what level you have to start with at least. In Romans chapter 12, look at verse 3 and following. Paul says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many parts, and the parts don't all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually we're parts one of another. 
Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If it's prophecy, if your gift is prophecy, use it in proportion to your faith. If it's service, in your serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Now you see, there's some more listing of different types of gifts that are given to the church. But don't miss what Paul said. He said, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but each of you with sober judgment, use your gifts in proportion to the measure you have been assigned. And then he said this, if your gift is preaching, use it in proportion to your faith. In other words, just because God might have gifted two different people or three different people or four different people or maybe five different people in your church to preach... That doesn't mean that they're all supposed to preach in the same way or to the same sizes of crowds. Have you ever noticed that there are some people, have you ever, has anybody here ever gone to like a big conference where there's like 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000, 10,000, and the guy that's up there can speak to 10,000 people and everybody feels like they've connected? They walk out of there and say, man, I heard from the Lord. What an amazing speaker. But you've got other guys that, they couldn't do that. But you know what? Years ago, I was uh, preaching at a church over in the west coast of Florida. And this pastor's now in heaven. He unfortunately passed uh, uh, from cancer, but and not unfortunately. He's with the Lord. So I guess you can say that's a good thing in one sense. But he actually was a pastor of a church. He'd been an associate pastor for a lot of years. But the church kept saying, when are you going to be the real pastor? When are you going to be the senior pastor? Well, not understanding things, he actually went and became senior pastor. And to be honest, he was a wonderful shepherd. He loved people. Wasn't the best preacher. But one day, I went and preached at his church because he and I had a great relationship and I'd speak regularly at that church. And I sat in on a class he was doing on Sunday evening, right before the evening service. He was teaching a 101 class of, for new believers and people that were curious about the faith. And there were probably five or ten people in that little classroom. And he was teaching them, who is God who is Jesus, and the basics of the faith, just the basic 101 level. And I sat there just blown away by how gifted he was. I got to be honest with you. I sat there thinking, I couldn't do what he's doing. If I went in and tried to teach brand new believers, I'd blow their heads. Because the gift that God's given me and how he's called and gifted me to preach is to equip people that know the word a little bit at least and to take you deeper and to show you the whole of scripture and to feed you with the word of God. I would have killed them. But this guy was so gifted. And when he started to realize, I'm not supposed to be the preacher of the big church. I'm gifted to teach in small groups. You might be taught to preach. But you're sitting there thinking, I, I, I couldn't do what Pastor Dave does. I couldn't stand up in front of all these people. Well, maybe you're not supposed to. Maybe you're supposed to teach a class. Maybe you're supposed to be a part of a Bible study. If it is God's plan to have you move up, you'll find that out in time. Folks, let me say something to you. I was going to do this near the end of the message. I feel like I'm supposed to do it now. Don't, you don't have to take a spiritual gift test to find out what your gift is. Doesn't the Bible say that the Holy Spirit will lead us and teach us and guide us and speak to us? Then why did we have to take a spiritual gift test to try to guess what our gifts are? Let me listen very closely. You want to find out what your gifts are? Get involved in the life of the church. Go to the Sunday school class. Go to the Bible study. Go to the Wednesday night program. Go to the men's group. Go to the women's retreat. Get involved in the life of the church. They're doing a fun day. They're doing a Bible study. Just go. And as you get involved in the life of the church, your gifts will become evident to you and to the people around you. You know how I ended up standing here in front of you today? It's because I went to Sunday school. I went to Sunday school at Lockmar Baptist Church as a teenager and as I sat in Sunday school, I kept going, can I show you something I think God just showed me to our lesson? And the teacher would say, well, well, what do you see, Jim? Well, I kind of see this. And after enough weeks of me going, can I show you something God showed me? They said, why don't you teach next week? I'm scared to death. You got to understand, when I was young, I found out this two or three weeks before I graduated high school, I found out that I was going to be 
giving a speech at graduation because the valedictorian and the salutatorian had to give a speech at high, at high school graduation. And they came to me and they said, you are number two in your class, so you're going to give a speech at graduation. And I didn't want to do that. I was so freaked out by speaking at graduation that I intentionally bombed some tests in the last week of school to lower my GPA where I graduated fourth in my class. I didn't tell my parents. They were proud. I said, hey, I graduated fourth. They said, you did awesome. They had no idea that I could have been one or two. But I did not want to speak in front of people. That wasn't my thing. So when the Sunday school teacher said, why don't you teach next week? I'm like, I was just trying to raise my hand. Okay. And you know what? I loved it. And the people said, would you do it again? And then in time, they said, a pastor recognized something and said, would you teach Sunday night's lesson in the evening service? And I remember the first time I was ever invited at a church to preach on Sunday morning at 11. It was such a big deal. I'm getting to preach on Sunday morning at 11. Now, I am preaching all over the globe, everywhere, on radio television, you name it, and God has me traveling the country preaching all the time. He wants to do that in your life too. But you've got to be willing to believe that he has a plan and a purpose. Too many people try to go and become the preacher at 11 instead of being willing to start where you are. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. But if your gift is giving, give a little bit. Give a little bit more. If your gift is teaching, teach. If its gift is serving, serve. If your gift is whatever. And the Bible's real clear that we are to do the works that he had prepared in advance for us to do. And like I said, if you get involved in the life of the church, it'll become evident to you in time. It'll be evident to the people around you what your gifts are. Oh, and by the way, if someone says, well, I don't see it. If your eyes are on the Lord, you don't care. I'm going to make a little statement about your announcement that you made today, Jeff, about the Christian uh, church directory of people working. I think it's a great idea, but I'm going to tell you right now, you've got to keep your eyes on the Lord if you do it. Here's why. Some of you have a business, and you're going to put your name in there, and someone in the church is going to hire somebody outside the church and not you. Let's just say you're a plumber, and you find out that Pastor Dave has a plumbing problem. And he could have looked in the church directory and saw that you were a plumber. And you found out he hired a plumber that wasn't in the church directory. And you're going to be offended. Guess what? Are your eyes on the Lord? Do you believe that God will give you all the business you need and all the business you want? Or do you feel like he, it's up to somebody else? You understand? In the same way, if they don't think you're gifted enough to lead... Keep your eyes on the Lord, because it'll happen when it's his time. But he's the God who, if a man shuts a door, I'm oh, sorry, just put it this way. The Bible says if he, if he shuts the door, no man can open it. But if he opens a door, no man can shut it. When I left the pastorate to go into this traveling ministry, I knew back when God called me to preach that I was going to travel. I knew that. I, when it became clear to me why my gifting was, I actually tried to even... I actually, my poor wife, I dragged her all over the southeastern U.S. doing Christian comedy and traveling and trying to speak, and that all flopped. And when I left the pastor to go into this preaching ministry 20 years ago, a lady ran up to the, my wife at the end of church and said, when did you know about this? And Becky's answer was so cool. She said, I knew when I married him. It just took a while. I'm now doing what I knew God had called me to do, but it took a long time. I had to serve years as a youth pastor, as an associate pastor, as a senior pastor in a couple of different churches in parts of the country. And then finally, I moved into what I knew God had put on my heart. So if you're feeling, I know what I'm supposed to do, and it doesn't happen right away, don't look at man and get mad that man didn't give you that opportunity. You put your eyes on the Lord, and if he's got it for you to do, it'll happen. Now, let me say this to you as well. He not only determines what your gifts are, he not only determines where and how and how much you have and where he wants you to use them and the when, 
He also is the one who will empower you to do it. You cannot use your gifts in your own strength. You've got to learn how to let him do it in his time, in his way, believing that he will. People say, how do you get up and preach without notes? I have notes. I wrote this sermon out. I've prayed over it. But I also have learned over the years how to believe that God will do through me what he has said he would do. I've got his word in my heart. I've got an outline in my head. And I'm letting the Holy Spirit show me where to go and when to go and what to say and what not to. And you've got to understand that the same God who called you and saved you and gifted you and has a plan for where he wants you to use it is the one that said, I will empower you also to do it. You've got to learn how to let me do it. Listen, the term burnout should have never, ever, ever been spoken in the church. Have you ever heard that? Anybody here in church ever heard that? I'm burnt out. Let me ask you a question. Does the Holy Spirit ever run out? Didn't Jesus promise rivers of living water? Didn't he say we'd never thirst again? The Bible doesn't teach burnout. The Bible teaches that if we learn to walk in the Spirit, he empowers us. Jesus went 40 days uh, without eating, and God empowered him to survive that. Moses as well. Jesus was, come, his disciples came up to him and said, eat something, and he said, I have food that you don't even know about. He had learned how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit in the same way in which we are to, that actually, the Bible actually says, well, go to 1 Peter chapter 4. Let me show you what I'm talking about. The Bible says that God is the one who wants to empower you to use your gift. 1 Peter chapter 4, look at verses 10 and 11. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Now, whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. If your attitude is, well, I was doing what God asked me to do in the church, but nobody else helped me. Are you doing it for their approval and their applaud? Or are you doing it for the Lord? And we're doing it by the strength that he provided. If no one else helps you, you'll be fine. Just do what he's asked you to do. Put your eyes on the Lord. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Look at verses 28 and 29. Paul says this, him, Jesus, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Let me say something to you. If you're feeling burnt out serving the Lord, you're either one, doing something he didn't call you or gift you to do, or two, You're doing what he's asked you to do, but you're doing it in your strength and not his. And that should be a wake-up call for you if you feel burnout. If you actually saw my schedule, it would freak you out. Because I'm not only traveling and speaking all over the country every week. I'm also teaching a regular Bible study where I go verse by verse through books of the Bible. They're available on our website. You can go tune into them. There's live streams. There's a YouTube channel. I'm literally preaching when I'm home in, back in my area. I'm preaching five times a week in my own area, not, not counting the six-day-a-week radio program that I also have. How could you do all that? God. It's what he's gifted me to do, and I've learned how to do it in the power of the Spirit. And I love it. It's fun. And I'm going to be preaching on a cruise ship in a couple of weeks. That's a tough assignment. It's a lot of work. But it's also a blessing. Folks, two last things. One, some of you are sitting there going, well, Jim, I don't, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a teacher. I, I don't have those gifts. Go with me to Exodus chapter 31. Exodus 31. Look at verses 1 through 6. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, 
And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood, to work in every craft. And, and behold, I have appointed with him a holy ab, the son of Ahissamach of the tribe of Dan, and I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. Did you catch that? God said, not only have I chosen for you guys to build me a tabernacle, I've already predetermined who's supposed to do the work. Chosen Bezalel, Aholiab, and some other guys. And I filled them with the Spirit of God and the power to be able to do the craftsmanship. They have the ability from me to do that kind of work. Jump over to chapter 36 of Exodus. Look at verses 1 and 2. Bezalel and Aholiab and every craftsman in whom the Lord has put skill and intelligence to know how to do any work in the construction of the sanctuary shall work in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. And Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every craftsman in whose mind the Lord had put skill, everyone whose heart stirred him up to come and do the work. Folks, in order for a place like this and the ministry of the work to go on, you don't just need preachers and teachers and Sunday school teachers. You also need people that are coming and unlocking doors and locking doors. You need people that are running the sound so that I can be able to be heard and recorded. There's people that are watching us online now because of people that know how to do the technology of the live stream. I have no idea how this works. I have people come across the country all the time to me and say, do you have a podcast? I'm like, yeah. I go, they go, how do we get to it? I go, I don't know. I really don't. Praise the Lord for Chris Wilson, who takes care of our website and all of our electronic stuff. And Elise, our, Becky's and my daughter, who works for our ministry as our media developer and takes care of the YouTube channel and all this other stuff. And I'm looking you in the eye and telling the honest truth. I've been doing it for 20 years. I still don't know how it works, and I don't know how to tell you how to find it. But praise the Lord his word is going out in ways I could have never imagined because there are people that don't preach and they don't teach. I used to call Chris every week two or three times and say, hey, I need you to make a change to the website. Hey, I just got booked again here. Would you fix the speaking schedule, blah, blah, blah. And I kept on saying, I'm sorry. Sorry to bother you. Hey, could you fix the speaking schedule? I just got booked here. Hey, Chris, sorry to do this to you. Could we make this tweak to the website? And he said this to me. He said, do you ever say, I'm sorry I get to preach and teach? I'm like, no. He go, he says, well, neither do I feel sorry when you let me do my gifts and work on the website. Stop saying sorry. Just tell me whenever you want something, I'll do it. Some of you, you might not be a noticeable part of the body, but you're just as necessary. We saw on the screen today that there's a need for children's workers. My prayer is that God stirs up the hearts of more than one or two, and they have a, a surplus. Well, I don't know if that's me. Try it. If it ain't, it ain't. If it is, you'll know it. And the kids will know it. And the leaders will know it. You don't have to know that I'm called by the Lord to do this. Get involved in the life of the church. Try it. Say, you know what? I'm willing to give it a shot. And if it becomes evident, you know, it ain't it. I know the leadership. I've been dealing with them for years. They'll be okay. They'll be glad that you gave it a shot. Here's the last thing. He doesn't need you. If you hopefully have been listening, you have not heard me say, oh, and if you don't do it, something's going to be lacking. You don't know who God is very well if you think something's going to be lacking. Jesus said, if we don't preach, the rocks will cry out. He can use a donkey if he needs to. Acts 17, 24 and 25 says he's not served by human hands if he needed anything. He don't need you. He don't need me. We'll miss out on some blessing. We'll miss out on some reward. But please don't think for a second that if you don't do it, the church will be lacking. Too many preachers try that mess. The church has been given gifts. And if you're not using your gifts, the church will be suffering that's a horrible view of God. Do you know Paul was writing to the church there in Corinth, dealing with all the mess? I didn't even get into the fact that they weren't even sharing the Lord's Supper with each other the right way. I didn't even get into the fact that there was a guy there in the church who the church was okay with who was having sex with his father's wife. 
By the way, you ever heard people say, we need to go back to the days of the early church and how they did it in the days of the early church. And I say, do you read your Bible? The early church was as messed up as us. Most of those churches we see in the book of Revelation don't even, they don't exist anymore. But we're going to close in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Listen to what Paul says to this messed up church that had people claiming to be spiritual who were causing chaos, fighting over preachers, approving of sexual sin that wasn't approvable, not taking the Lord's Supper correctly so much that some were sick and some were dead. Listen to what Paul says to this church. Paul, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians called by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ and to our brother Sosthenes. To the church of God that is in Corinth and those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you. Because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you catch that? This church was a mess. They had a lot of problems. But he also could look them in the eye and say, it's all right. As you grow in the relationship with the Lord and your knowledge of him, he'll work on these areas. And you have everything you need already. So, folks, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for that. I've had this privilege of being able to come and to share this series this weekend and this message, especially this morning with the folks here. Lord, I thank you that for, as Dave and I were talking, we've had this privilege of this relationship for probably 16 years now. I thank you that when I show up, there's a smile and I can recognize right away that we just have a love for each other that has been developed over the years. And Lord, I thank you that as I'm standing here today, I have seen growth over the years, not just numerically, because that's not the issue as much as spiritually. And Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for the fact that you are at work. And I pray now that we would exalt you by believing what your word says. Lord, some of us might need to take baby steps, but we need to get plugged in. Lord, keep the leadership from trying to use guilt and shame and pressure. May we believe, all of us, the leadership as well as the individuals in a big God who has a plan and will accomplish everything that he sets out to accomplish. And Lord, may we grow in our love for each other in the process. Because that's why Paul went from this whole chapter on spiritual gifts right into chapter 13, where he taught them really the most important thing is love. And so, Father, may that happen in this place. May a growth of love occur even more. I thank you for the way in which I've seen people just enjoy being together ahead of time and after services, just talking and spending time together. Lord, thank you for the work that you're doing for your kingdom and your glory here at Momentum. And until Jesus comes, may it continue for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name.